Whoa, did you hear that then? Listen, all right, up. so we're in a young person's car. It smells of energy drinks and perfume, obviously. Quite nice, he's stitched this on. Done a good job of this. It's a bit lumpy, but whatever. Listen to the engine turning over and I'll explain. Listen to the electricity. Very sluggish. Probably got main cable or ground cable fault. Engine's lumpy. Let's turn that subwoofer off. Good. So the problem with this car is, the problem with this is the power disappears at 3000 RPM. He's changed the accelerator pedal. Well, that's what people do when they don't know what they're doing, right? He's not a mechanic. He's not a fault finder, but I am. And Thomas will be too. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go for a lovely Rotus in this beautifully modified 320D N47, 2007 model. All sorts of, oh, it's on 503,192 kilometers. Yeah. Let's see what the problem is. You know, the other day, Someone was saying how, how crap the N47 engine is. Idiots, basically. It's one of the best diesel engines ever made. So what if you have put a time in here once, twice in 500,000 kilometers? Does it mean it's bad? Not really. It just means that that's how things were these days. And really, it's not a problem, is it? Change, it's a service item in that sense. There's literally no power. So we got some more information now. Apparently there's a DPF issue. I got told on one bloody version that it's essentially got a problem where they've changed the accelerator because there's a flat spot. It doesn't rev over 3,000. Well, it's just, it had a bit of a judder, but it's just gone to 4,000 actually. We just try and rev it now. Very sluggish. Look, it's struggling there. Can you see? Now it won't rev at all. So it probably is DPF's blocked and it's shifting. The such shifting maybe. Oh, there you are, it's flat as a witch's tip, that. Look, it won't go over 3,000. So that's the issue. We're on the motorway. We're doing 20 litres, 100 kilometres, nearly, and it won't go over 3,000. Let's read the fault codes. Great, we're just confirming them. Let's go back. Let's look at live data. We need to look at, first thing, the coolant temperature. Remember, we've just been for a bit of a skank in it now, so, you know, it should be quite reasonable. Let's look at lows. Let's look at ambient temperature. Charger, we don't need, the charger temperature sensor is a huge one on these cars. It goes wrong, it thinks it's too hot, and therefore it reduces the boost pressure. That's one thing you should always check, because it doesn't give a fault code specifically. Well, first of all, let's put it in bloody, you know, degrees C. Well, the coolant temperature is 52, right? It's not enough, so it needs a thermostat, first of all, because when I got to the car, it was already warm. It obviously not been long here. Charger temperature <laughs> seems reasonable. It's dropping quite significantly, isn't it? It could be that the charge temp actually goes too cold. Or, if you can hear that, there's a problem with the release bearing. So that's knackered as well, but that's just something else. Temperature's three degrees, they don't update very quickly. It's three degrees, great. Charger is reasonable, but look at the coolant, it's dropping now, can you see? So the thermostat's knackered, that's the main cause. Now it's going up, but it dropped from 50 odd. So the main reason for this DPF not regenerating is the engine coolant temperature thermostat. So it needs a new one of them. What else can we look at? Well, if we put the um, pipe on the back so that we don't fill the workshop with smoke, we can look at the charge pressure, actual ambient pressure as well. That's basically atmospheric pressure. Lights just gone off, probably because there's a battery problem. Uh, can we do it in bar? No, we'll keep it in millibar. Let's have a look at that. Rail pressure's okay. You can see that's okay there. Charge air pressure specified, 990 millibar. Actual, it's actually got a bit too much pressure. Ambient pressure is the same. And you see, not enough boost pressure now. 1300, 1000. So basically, there's an issue with not enough boost pressure and an issue with essentially the coolant temp and therefore the DPF is blocked. So can we find anything about the DPF in this? Maybe we can't actually. Particle filters there, good. Let's look at the DPF system. A bit different than ISTA. Let's change this, of course, into um, metric. Last regeneration in meters, let's do it in kilometers. 
because it's a bit weird doing it in meters 93 kilometers usually every 300 they'll regenerate regeneration not active and it's not even requested it what's the back pressure this is very important you see how it's flickering that back pressure sensor let's put it in graph form see how it's twittering like that it's not right that it's not normal it's doing that because it's knackered back pressure sensors buggered that's another thing that can go wrong with these let's check it back pressure is huge it cannot be more than 30 millibar at idle and it's 140 120 it's dropping that's not normal sensors knackered 96 is still too high but it was 140 odd then right so we need to now confirm the real back pressure using a mechanical gauge let's do that let's formulate our plan let's fix this car so what I'm going to do on this now, I've just took that pipe off, you can actually see it's completely full of soot. That's a good sign, that's a good clue that it's absolutely full of soot. So I'm expecting to see a very good back pressure reading, just like we saw on Think Tool. Now it's time to connect our manual gauge and manometer and see if it matches the Think Tool values. If it does, then we need to look at the DPF more. <laughs> okay. So I reached a peak of 3 PSI at one point, which according to this online calculator is 206 millibar. Nice. Right, so what I'm doing is I'm connecting the um, Mitivac to the back pressure sensor. That's the sensor we just used to get the values on the Think Tool and on the manual manometer, you know, gauge. And what we're actually doing now is we're going to put pressure in it, simulating the exhaust back pressure. And we're going to just look at the sensor, how it responds, basically, to be fair. So as we push this in, there's a Wheatstone bridge in there. I've done a video about that before. And it deflects and a deflected element and it changes the voltage uh, based on the resistance of the bridges and it gives an output voltage basically and then obviously the dd knows what pressure is voltage equals pressure uh, on a on a on a log scale so that's what we're doing here and as you can see from the screen sorry about the lights not so clear but it is working so although it, it um was twittering a bit it's probably a bit iffy we might get away with it we might not we'll try it and we'll see what happens but we'll see so that was it for that job short and sweet really isn't it but basically it come in they changed the accelerator pedal throttle whatever i don't really care what they've done but they've done something and um essentially all you need is a bit of troubleshooting skills don't you so first thing we found was the coolant temperature was way too low so it needs a thermostat and an egi thermostat and that's one of the reasons why it won't regenerate it's an m47 by the way there's no swirl flaps on this m series engine it's a pre-n n series so it's not an n47 it's an m mic Sounds the same, doesn't it? M47. And uh, there's no swerve flops to worry about. So coolant thermostat really affects DPF regenerating. If the engine doesn't get hot, it won't get hot enough on the exhaust side to regenerate. So it fails a lot. DPF's full, basically. We'd probably be able to put some JLM fluid in that. You could do it yourself. Don't take them off and clean them. It's a waste of time with a jet wash. It's just JLM or replace it. Second thing we did, we checked was the back pressure sensor itself using a Mitivac. Because when we use a Mitivac, we can put a pressure impulse inside it, input the pressure, look at the output on the thing to a live data. Or if you don't have live data, you can put a voltmeter on fluke meter or whatever and look at the voltage change. As the Wheatstone bridge deflects, voltage will change in proportion to the Wheatstone bridge deflection. And the ECU, the DD, has a lookup table. It knows exactly at what bridge pressure, sorry, at what voltage it equals how much um, back pressure, not bridge pressure, sorry. That was actually the second thing though. Third thing, the boost pressure's not working properly now. That could be caused by a lot of things, but usually it's because there's too much back pressure and it's completely choking the engine, so boost won't work properly. I did check the VNT, electrical motor, the supply in the axle shaft, that's good, it's not seized. Also, we checked the temperature sensor in the um, intake system, the charger, the temp sensor isn't faulted, usually they are faulty. So I'll do a short and sweet video, but I hope it gives you a couple of ideas if you've got a DPF system, how you can, you know, how you can check it, especially using a manometer. It's very important you actually because those sensors go faulty a lot, it's very important to use a manometer, like I did, to confirm that it's exactly what you're seeing on the live gauge of your diagnostic test tool, because otherwise, I've seen people see 200 millibar and think it's got a block DPF, but actually in reality, it had a block DPF in the past. Some of the garage would have changed it on, on hypothetical car I'm talking about now, and uh, they never changed the back pressure sensor. So lo and behold, back pressure is probably 10 millibar, perfect, but the sensor's displaying 200 because it's knackered, the Wheatstone Bridge has got on, it's knackered, you know? So there you are, hope you enjoyed it. See you soon for more videos, got loads more coming, some right cool stuff. Don't forget to subscribe, you really help me out. Thanks, see you soon.